Okay, right. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be presenting on on our uh, remote sensing capabilities for uh, for infrastructure and just kind of give a little bit of an overview of to, uh, the different services that we can offer from from aerial photography and lidar and uh, some of the applications for for infrastructure. There'll be time for questions and, and comments at the end. So if you can hold your hold your questions for now, that'd be great. Um, so I'll 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 get into the into the detail pretty quickly, really, but just a, a couple of, of very brief introductory slides. Um, uh, my name is David Campbell. I'm an associate director at APEM. I've been with the company about fifteen years, um, and I head up our remote sensing consultancy uh, team. Um, we have. Um, a team of around um, 25 people in the in the remote sensing department. Uh, they are ranging from people who go out into the into the aircraft to collect the data through to through to processes and uh, uh, consultants and report writers. APM as a whole, uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, um, we kind of service. We focus on on uh, the water industry and the utilities industry um, quite heavily, and we kind of service everything from from kind of the the upland catchments through to through down to the um, down down to the sea, kind of, and, and everything that happens in between. Really, uh, we've got consultants that that are, are terrestrial ecologists, fishery scientists. Um, we have uh, a marine team. That, that, that look at offshore wind farms, but we also have this quite large remote sensing team that focuses on uh, aerial photography for for a range of a range of clients. And and what the ones I'm talking about today is going to be the ones where we focus on infrastructure. Um, got a number of offices dotted around the UK and Ireland. Um, around 180 staff as a, as a company as a whole. We also have quite a large presence in the states. Uh, a lot of surveys going on over, over there and uh, we also survey in Australia so we have kind of a global reach but um, we have most of our work is done in kind of the UK and Ireland um, and some of the things we're going to be able to cover that, that kind of went out in the in the email introductions um, how we can collect topographic data uh, pre and post construction condition assessments virtual health and safety site assessments and site inductions and the, the 3D uh, photorealistic environment that we can create from 3D imaging and I'll show you a, I'll show you a kind of a live demo of that towards the end of the presentation so you really get a feel for, um, for, for how that can work and how it can benefit hopefully some of your projects. Okay so into the detail so I'll just start with giving a, a, an overview of the different um, types of data that be, can be generated from aerial imagery. Uh, the first one is topographic surveys um, uh, from photogrammetry. So photogrammetry is essentially an image-based product. So it's overlapping imagery um, that would cover the landscape. And because it's overlapping, the uh, the stereo image you can convert it into height data so we can create ortho mosaics um, that, are, that are very precisely tied into its ordinance datum uh, but we can also generate elevation from that so we can generate a height model that the imagery can be overlaid on so photogrammetry is one of the data types that we collect from aerial imagery the other one lidar uh, lidar is an active sensor it's a laser that's that comes out from the from the from the um, from the whole of the aircraft that kind of pings the landscape, gets very accurate um, uh, positional returns from those returns from the lasers that generates a, a point cloud of the landscape, essentially. Um, and the main differences between generating topography from photogrammetry from LIDAR is that LIDAR can punch through the tree canopy so we can get returns from, um, from from the, the surf, from the ground surface below a tree canopy, whereas photogrammetry can't, but there's other benefits going the other way, and, and, and I'll kind of tease them out as we go. 
Uh, and the third type of data that, data that we can collect is that it's not just color, color imagery. We can go into all the parts of the, of the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum as well. So this is, uh, this is a color imagery uh, image of a uh, water company treatment site. Um, and if, we, if I show the near infrared uh, version of that, you can see it looks quite different. So near infrared is um, beyond the visible spectrum and it's very sensitive to changes in vegetation. So um, where you get very strong, healthy vegetation, you get those bright reds and pinks that you can see where there is isn't any help when there isn't any vegetation or there's very uh, water stressed vegetation for example you get those kind of blue green washed out colors so that's why I kind of this was taken in winter so um, some of the trees are very uh, gray green apart from there's a couple of trees you might be able to, to um, point out that probably evergreen trees and that's why they're showing, showing bright, bright red so that's useful in some of our analysis and habitat classifications to have that near infrared layer that shows the differences in vegetation as well as that color imagery and the, and the data are collected uh, at the same time. Um, we can also collect thermal imagery and that's uh, an example of a, a, a thermal data set so it's obviously showing the temperature of the landscape uh, again same site um, just as an example this was this was done for purposes of looking at heat loss from uh, from different parts of the um, of the site uh, but also other things were teased out from that for example the, the, the temperature of the filter beds there and those 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 circular um, uh, constructions in the middle of the in the middle of the image there there's those bank of, of circles on the filter beds and the one on the bottom left was a different temperature from the from the other ones um, and that kind of highlighted there was an operational problem with that filter bed that they didn't know to uh, before for the for them for the operational managers of that site so lots of information can be teased out from thermal imagery as well as um, uh, as well as the color in the near infrared so what do we do with those uh, data sets well firstly topographic data is, is what we're often asked to create surveys and, and survey designs for. Um, it could be for new pipe routes, it could be for new uh, electricity cable routes, it could be for uh, a new construction site where it's important to understand the, the topography of the site. Um, and aerial imagery is a good way of getting up there and surveying big areas in a very short um, um, space of time might be a problem with land access so that's often why we're asked to go that can't necessarily get teams out on the ground so we would use either photogrammetry or lidar or in some, some cases um, a combination of, of the two uh, and then we're providing high density point clouds um, digital surface models um, and digital terrain models the difference between the two is the surface models um, contain all the surface features of the landscape, so trees, buildings, etc., are included in that high model. Digital terrain model is uh, with all those surface features stripped out, so you just kind of get that bare earth layer. Um, and if there's vegetation around, then that's where it's useful to to have the the lidar technology as part of that as well, because you can punch through the landscape, the, the tree canopy, and get data from the um, uh, from the ground level. Eleva elevation maps. ASCII grid files, contour maps are often what we're asked for to do. Uh, and the kind of the reality meshes and the VR ready virtual fly throughs, those are um, creating a 3D environment that we can we can navigate around. And I'll show the examples of that um, um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, and a couple of examples of contour maps. Sometimes it, it, it's as simple as as, um, as we're doing uh, land cover and the outputs are our contours, um, which is you know kind of akin to what's generated from on the ground, but this is generated from from the air. Uh, the difference being that you know on the ground you're probably looking at the break lines um, um, when measuring the topography. Here we are sampling the the earth at well with lidar, you know, kind of ten plus points per square meter. So there's literally over, over a, a survey area, there's millions upon millions of data sets that the, that the contours were created from. So um, um, in, in terms of the detail, really picking up those small undulations in, in the landscape, and uh, this is you know, a great method for it. 
Um, I'll come back to, to visualizations um, for stakeholder engagement as part of the 3D data set. So an example of, of where we did this um, was for a road project. This was up in, in Scotland um, a couple of years ago, and there was a, there was a bypass around uh, Aberdeen. Uh, it, was, it was just under 60 kilometers in length. And because of the speed at which um, they were trying to survey everything that was going on in the construction site, all the excavated material, um, it wasn't practical to rely on ground surveys at that scale. Um, there would be too many um, topographic surveys that would be needed to be on site at the same time as heavy plant moving around excavating material. So they wanted to remove the survey aspect of it from the ground and put that into the air. Um, there were other those those safety concerns um, and the timescales as well. The, the, it was being developed um, concurrently over the whole site, so the time to get all the data from the from the ground teams. Um, wasn't something that was practical. Obviously, they wanted to kind of manage the costs as well. So what we did was we surveyed surveyed the site. Um, that 58 kilometres was surveyed in around six hours. Uh, this is with a manned aircraft. This isn't with a drone, by the way. This is with manned aircraft with um, sensors fit, uh, fixed in, in, in into the aircraft. Um, download the imagery, produce the um, continuous ortho mosaic. Those um, high density surface models um, and those 3D models of the site were then created. Um, and it generated very accurate topographic data. Uh, and that could be used by the engineers for earthworks calculations. And that's what one of, for, for this one, that was one of the primary aims of the of the project was to was to have a look at how much excavated material there was uh, and in terms of you know how many lorries do they need to order to to um, to remove that material, and that was once we've got the 3D model, very easy to, to extract that type of information from the data set. Um, and also looking at um, the construction phasing and how it's been developed. Um, so the um, this was an example of, of the site as it, as it was being. Um, as it was being generated, that's an example of the, the, the detail of the imagery. That, this was a five centimetre or seven centimetre resolution data. We can go a lot higher, a lot more detailed than this, but for the purposes of this, uh, they wanted to go at, uh, at a five to seven centimetre resolu resolution data. So that's what, what the data um, quality was like along the 60 kilometres. And then looking at the, the kind of the development of the site, as things change, there's some excavated material on that on that bottom on that on that um, that square to the right, um, and then because we were doing this repeatedly, um, we were able to build up that 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 information database at, at the, the kind of the construction phasing and how things were being developed. So that was one example. Um, another aspect that we're often asked to go out and survey for is uh, is Height mapping and leak detection. Um, it's it's generally uh, for water companies uh, that um, uh, that we're asked to do that for, uh, and we either go out with the thermal or the near infrared data. And what we're doing there is we're surveying again with um, fixed wing manned aircraft. We're flying along the pipe routes and collecting data. In the winter, we use thermal data to, to look at that because um, we're looking at the temperature differential between a potential leak and very cool surrounding ground so we go in we go on a cold dry night in winter uh, and then the differences in temperature from from a leak versus the the ambient surrounding temperature um, we can see in the data in the summer we go with the near infrared and that was when I was um, uh, mentioning about the, the difference in changing um, vegetation uh, response in the near infrared. Um, when there's a leak in the summer, the, the ground, the vegetation stays um, um, enriched with, with water. And if we go during a dry period, the background in, in information, the background um, uh, environment is, is slightly water stressed. So those 
kind of well watered um, patches of vegetation show up really brightly in the in the near infrared. So that's how we use the the, the method in the in the summer to, to look at to look at leakage. We can often also look at the uh, look at the root of the of the pipes and and map those if needed. And sometimes we're asked to help find the root of the pipe, uh, and that can be seen either through the sometimes through the thermal imagery, but often just through the uh, the high resolution data set, looking at valves, looking at um, um, disturbances to the earth, and the slight changes in vegetation that you get because there's a pipe underneath the underneath the um, surface. Uh, vegetation encroachment and invasive species, something that we look at as well. Um, we're looking at very high resolution data sets in three dimensions. And I should also say that we don't all, all we don't just collect imagery in the vertical. We also have an array of cameras on our on our uh, on our aircraft that capture data obliquely as well. So we're looking. We we can see the sides of the buildings and the sides of tree uh, structures as well. So when we're looking at vegetation encroachment, perhaps along perhaps on a road, that's something that we can develop uh, into a three D model and able to see that. Um, we can also look at that plant vegetation health and vigor, you know, looking at stress trees, which ones might be at risk of falling onto a carriageway, for example, and that's shown up through that, that near infrared imagery. Um, species identification and, have, and uh, invasive species mapping. Japanese knotweed is a big problem. If we go at the right time of year in, uh, in late summer, we can see that uh, the resolution is such that we can, we can see the um, Japanese knotweed and Himalayan balsam, for example, and be able to um, undertake species identification and see the extent of that um, of that species and often that's important when you're not just looking along your asset corridor you might want to look kind of left and right of that to see if there's a, a bank of Japanese knotweed that's kind of spreading and, and it's about to impact on your asset really important to know and uh, aerial photography can get that 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 view of not just your asset but what's happening either side of it that may may uh, may impact on that. Um, overhead line uh, equipment mapping, that's something that uh, uh, often lie down, sometimes photogrammetry is used for. And that's looking at very high resolution um, point cloud data to pick out the, the overhead lines, but also the vegetation uh, surrounding that, looking at uh, vegetation encroachment. Um, so this is an example of how you can use a LiDAR point cloud and classify it into different areas. So when the, when the LiDAR is pinging over the landscape, it's um, generating returns from everything, really. It's from the vegetation, it's from the ground, it's from buildings, it's from the, uh, from the power cables. And we can then classify all those point clouds into useful uh, features that we, can, that we can turn into maps. So for example, we could classify the ground um, and strip everything out, strip all the vegetation, the overhead power lines out, and just show us what the what the bare earth is. And those are the ground points there that we that we that, that we're getting from the lidar. Uh, we can pick out the overhead line points as a, as a separate um, layer. Uh, we can pick up the the low vegetation um, and also the tall vegetation, the trees, and they can all be classified as different um, different different points in the point cloud. And then we can start to look at proximity analysis to uh, overhead power lines, for example. Um, so when it comes to looking at that in terms of power lines, the, 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 the kind of traditional way is to go out on the ground and survey along spans of um, electricity cables, looking at um, um, on the ground measurements, except um, essentially with the aircraft, you can classify the vegetation, you know the location of the power line, so you can essentially do that, um, that risk in a 3D environment. Um, and you know, pick up, also pick out which, which trees are at risk of falling, the falling arc of the trees um, might, might intersect with the, with the power lines, for example. So again, it's about mapping the landscape, generating uh, a digital environment, of which you can then go in and do all sorts of different analysis that you could do out in the field, but you're doing it from, from the office um, and you're, you, you, you're, you're getting that fuller data set. Um, land cover and habitat classification. 
We're often asked to do a, a land cover and habitat assessment as part of uh, a new infrastructure development. So if it's a new power uh, cable route, for example, um, when doing undertaking route selection, the, uh, the power company will want to know what's going to have the least impact from an ecological point of view, um, um, but also what land it's going over and what, what issues they might have to um, encounter along the way. So surveying that, um, classifying that into uh, land cover, so you know, kind of improved grasslands, um, uh, forest, water, um, agricultural land, etc. That's a key output for for the for the ecologists and for the for the planning teams, um, and that will inform you know perhaps which route they take, but also will inform where to target the ground teams, the ground ecologists. Um, when I'm not saying that this is replacing ground teams completely, this is um, this is um, complementing them and targeting them. And uh, there's an example for a new, a new pipe route that. Uh, the ecologists needed to go out and survey all the all the ponds in the area for newts, but they weren't sure where all the ponds were. Um, so, going carrying out an aerial top, an, an aerial imaging survey of that to identify all the ponds along the route was a very quick way of being able to target the the ground teams to go out and do the newt surveys that they needed to be done during a specific um, seasonal window. Otherwise, they would have had to wait for the whole for a whole year till the next seasonal window which would have put the program back by a year so getting a survey done earlier on in the program really accelerated the whole thing and that's what, we're, what we often see uh, that's a 3d representation of the, of the habitat map um, uh, and looking at change if we do repeat surveys um, it is something that we do as well um, looking at change in the landscape and looking at mon monitoring restoration response as well this is a survey this was actually from the Ever we everglades i've mentioned that we do a lot of surveys in the states as well um, uh, this was an area that was where habitat was being improved vegetation was being planted uh, and we were tracking that well we still are tracking that we've been doing that for about seven years now where we've surveyed and looking at changes in the landscape and how vegetation is is coming back due to the, the kind of that managed um, managed land uh, processes that are going on, uh, and just high resolution imagery for for looking at assets um, uh, is is something that we do. It's not just the vertical imagery that we get. We, as I say, we have this array of imagery and we collect oblique data as well. Um, and yeah, that's an example of that. I think that's a ga gas processing station that, that, that we that we surveyed. Um, and I'll show you I'll show you some some more example images shortly. Is it, they don't always come as, as through quite as uh, cleanly on the on the PowerPoint presentation. But anyway, these 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 images are around kind of um, three centimeter resolution. Um, so that's every every pixel represents three centimeters on the ground. Again, often fixed wing aerial photography rather than drones um, which means that we're we're collecting the the detail that a drone could get but over the the scale that um that, that a manned aircraft can get okay so i'm going to come out of the presentation uh, and i'm just going to show you a couple of um examples of the of the of the data that we create so firstly i'll show you what a two centimeter resolution looks like and the detail that we can get with that because that's what we're often um being asked to go out and survey at the moment so this is a this is a, a treatment facility so if i zoom in you can see what what kind of level of detail you get at two centimeters um so obviously you yeah, know picking up a couple of things temporary fencing there yeah you can quickly easily easily pick that out um details of pipes etc handrails across the um uh the, the walkway there um, and if I just move over to kind of a back garden setting, just to give you a, a different context, you know, we're seeing the we're seeing the washing line, um, and, and it's picking up that level of detail um, in terms of the uh, detail of vegetation. That's the sort of information that we're getting that we can start producing those habitat maps from. Um, so again, you know, if that scale of information would be useful on your local asset individual side by side basis 
or you know kind of across big areas a whole new new linear routes um, for example that's what can be achieved um, through through aerial imaging and um, a 3d data set I'll show you this is an example of this isn't this is available online um, so we start with the with the, with the kind of the, the top-down two-dimensional view um, which is I, I suppose that the, um, the data sets that people are most familiar with perhaps but we can turn that into the three dimensions and because we have those oblique imagery collecting data from the sides of the building we, we can pick up data from the sides of the buildings as well um, and you know when I was talk, talking before about looking at excavated material you know this is what's what's available in the three dimensions and we could draw a polygon around that and and get some information from that we can measure heights of buildings we can measure um, um, distances between sites sometimes we're asked to go from a health and safety point of view for a site to look at um, uh, you know where safe to park vehicles where are the slopes is that where's the turning circles on vehicles and get up-to-date information from that and kind of do virtual health and safety site visits from it um, I'll just pick up a couple of other interesting things from an infrastructure point of view on this um, data set this was this this data set was used for a whole range of ecological and infrastructure um, uh, uh, aspects but um, looking at looking at pipe groups uh, for example so um, I mentioned before that you can see often see the, the root of a pipe because of uh, changes in vegetation at the surface well this this kind of linear feature this was this was a pipe and you can see um, um, you can see uh, valve the valve lids um, at a junction point there and that change in vegetation there is probably probably that that's leaking as well um, and uh, let's just go to just to prove it was a pipe that you could see there's the pipe crossing point there um, a lot of the time we're looking at, at, at from an um, attachment perspective we're looking at uh, diffuse pollution and problems in the in the in the catchment from a kind of a uh, land practice problems causing problems for the water but also um, uh, outflows into the into the water um, into the rivers as well um, and there's an example uh, let's see if I find it, uh, there well, you can see there's clearly an outfall coming from there that was that was causing problems with the river and that was something that the water company didn't know about so that was picked up from the from the aerial imagery um looking at biodiversity uh, and natural capital this provides the bulk of the information that you would need to do that biodiversity um assessment from this because you can see what the vegetation is you can see the the location the proximity to um to to other features and also the the, the height and the volume of trees and hedgerows etc um, so it would be possible to create a biodiversity assessment from uh, from this data set as well and then the last thing uh i wanted to show you was um how we use the data for from a stakeholder engagement perspective so this was a 3d model that we created um, and um, this was used for a new development of a, of a new cable route that was going into to an area this was from a from an offshore wind farm uh, that was needed to be connected to the to the local grid so we, we photographed it um, in stereo, created a 3D model of it, and then we can start overlaying features. So the yellow is the site boundary, the, the purple is the is the new cable routes, um, and everything else is is um, photorealistic 3D models. And this was taken to stakeholder engagement events to kind of show the public what was going to be installed. Everything there is real, apart from. The power station, which is which comes from the from the design drawings um, that's overlaid on the 3D model, um, 
And the other thing that's dropped in there that isn't from the imagery are these kind of slightly different colored vegetation um, that are around here. So that was part of the vegetation management to sort of screen the, um, screen the substation. Um, and it was taken to public supply days uh, to, to local residents and they could they could move around the model. This is a this is a, a fly through. We recorded this, but this was uh, available in real time, and we could uh, sit down with the um, with the local residents and say, "Well, okay, what's what's it going to look like from your house? What's it going to look look like from your upstate bedroom window or from where you walk your dog?" And we could just zoom around to to see what change it would it would look like from their um, from their point of interest. Um, and just this next one there is an example of these trees that are coming along um, a lot here. Those are those are part of the screening, and, you could, and, and people could see you know what what that was going to look like from their perspective. So um, that is kind of the end of the uh, of the presentation. Um, just a quick summary. High resolution mapping, topography surveys, um, looking at 3D modeling and earthworks calculation, um, looking at assets, looking at vegetation proximity, habitat and land cover mapping, and then those visualizing the, um, uh, the site remotely um, for, for stakeholder engagement. So I'll stop sharing my screen at that point and yeah, just open open up the floor to see if there's, if there's any any questions um or, or comments and um, if anybody's got any i'll get, i'll leave it i'll leave it a couple of minutes so if there is anything um there'll be there'll, this i believe we're going to um we're going to send this uh, recording round um, if, the, if this has kind of sort of piqued anybody's interest and they've got some projects coming up um, that they would be interested in, in having an idea of, you know, kind of what would this survey do for you, then, you know, please get in touch uh, and we can discuss, um, we can discuss what, what might be possible. These are just a few examples that I've shown you here. Often people come to us to sort of say, well, I want to get this out of it. What, what can you do? So. You know what I've shown there isn't isn't the the bounds of, of what you can get out of the imagery. Um, you know, I, I encourage you to sort of think creatively and, and think, well, could a could an aerial survey be of interest um, a, a part of our part of our project? Um, so yeah, do get in touch if there's any questions. There's something in the chat. Uh, there was a question there. What formats can you export three D data models in? Um, so uh, the point clouds are, are typically exported in dot uh, LAS format. Um, the 3D models are typically dot OBJ um, files. Um, they do integrate with with CAD. They integrate with the Bentley software. Uh, in fact, the, the the data that we're creating is Bentley software, so they integrate um, uh, kind of seamlessly with those. And we often um integrate it with our clients needs so if there is a particular format that you you need your 3d model uh, to be created in you know you know drop me a line and i'll, I'll speak to our technical expert, experts and, and get back to you to see if, see if we could do that any other any other thoughts or questions before uh, before we draw it to a close there No, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, hopefully, it was uh, uh, an interesting kind of half an hour, forty-five minutes. And uh, as I say, please feel free to get in touch um, with any with any further comments or questions, or if you want us to, to kind of cost anything up. All right. Thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.